Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Melissa Ridgen. From Quebec City to Winnipeg to Alberta, trucker protests against vaccine mandates, a state of emergency in Ottawa, demonstrations disrupting traffic and the economy in many places. The latest is Windsor, Ontario, hit with three days of rolling protests on the Ambassador Bridge to Detroit. It's slowing the busiest border crossing in North America to a crawl. As of today, there are around 100 protesters and 50 to 70 vehicles involved. In Ottawa, the federal government is responding to protests there. Emergency Preparedness Minister Bill Blair says his government is working to put an end to the unlawful gathering. Blair says the Ontario Provincial Police have been helping out in Ottawa for the past two weeks, but that more political leadership is needed. This occupation requires all of us to come together to use all of the authorities are available that are available at our disposal. Many of the legis legislation and authorities um, to, to deal with this unlawful protest reside in the Provincial Highway Traffic Act and municipal bylaws. And, and of course, it is the province of Ontario and the Solicitor General who have ultimate responsibility for policing and the maintenance of public safety in the province. Invitations have been extended to Minister Jones and her officials, and we, we are very hopeful and confident that they will be joining us at our next meeting. Blair also says the blockades currently at the U.S. border in Ontario and Alberta are hurting the Canada's economy. Well, Albertans will no longer need to show proof of vaccination to go to a movie or a pub or a restaurant. Premier Jason Kenney lifted the restrictions today, but some Indigenous communities are not following suit. Tamara Pimentel explains why as COVID-related hospital admissions are declining. Alberta's Premier Jason Kenney announced the vaccine passport is no longer necessary. The program is no longer serving a useful and compelling purpose. It's the first phase of a three-step plan to ease public health measures in the province that began at midnight last night. Children aged 12 and under will also be exempt from wearing masks in schools starting Monday. It has also and always been the government's approach to keep public health measures in place only so long as they are absolutely necessary to protect public health and our health care system. Kenny said Alberta passed the peak of Omicron infections weeks ago and COVID-related hospital admissions are declining. But Dr. James Makokas from Saddle Lake Cree Nation says lifting these restrictions isn't such a great idea. He stated in an email, I'm really worried for our people who have low double and triple vax rates, as well as low pediatric rates. And on the Blood Tribe, a representative told us that existing enhanced safety measures will be kept in place until further notice. When asked if the Premier's easing of COVID restrictions has any connection with the convoy blocking the Alberta-US border. None of that has to do anything with a few trucks uh, parked uh, uh, at the Coots border crossing. All of it has to do with the fact that the disease is changing and so the approach that we take to manage it should change as well. Step two of phasing out public health measures will begin in March. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Calgary. Lifting proof of vaccination requirements in Saskatchewan is not going over well with Indigenous communities in that province. Yesterday, the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations urged band members to continue COVID protocols in spite of the government's decision. APTN's Leanne Saunders reports. The Northern Intertribal Health Authority gives health advice to the chiefs of 33 First Nations in the far north. The authority's Dr. Namdi Dabuka says the government's timeline for lifting restrictions doesn't align with the reality on the ground and comes too soon. We in public health as well as our, uh, our chief and council and other uh, leaders are quite concerned. Uh, particularly for um, uh, two main reasons. Number one is that um, our COVID-19 vaccination coverage rate is not yet optimal and we are lagging behind the provincial coverage. And um, secondly, um, traditionally we do have um, a lag in the Omicron wave. In the previous wave, first wave, second, third and fourth, they're not oftentimes lag behind by about two to three weeks. So it's our understanding that um, the Omicron wave it's yet to peak in the north. 60% of those eligible in the authority's coverage area are fully vaccinated with two doses, but just 16% have their boosters. And communities have been hit hard in the pandemic. Dr. Dubuka says the government's lifting of some restrictions starting Monday puts a lot of pressure on those working on the front lines. 
Actually, we do support that First Nation communities uh, continue to implement uh, measures that they deem uh, uh, appropriate to maintain safety within communities. But obviously, um, uh, announcements like this really puts a lot of pressure on us in terms of uh, appropriately providing guidance in a way that uh, uh, the communities will remain safe. Leanne Sanders, APTN National News, Saskatoon. Two Northern BC First Nations will be filing a court appeal to hold Rio Tinto responsible for the impacts of a dam built 70 years ago. The Saikas and the Stolatin want the Nichaco River restored to protect their fish stocks. APTN's Lee Wilson has more. Last month, the BC Supreme Court ruled management of the Kenny Dam by mining company Rio Tinto breached the Saikas and Stolatin First Nations Aboriginal rights to fish. The court did not find the company legally responsible for the impacts of the river due to the provincial and Canadian governments authorizing Rio Tinto. SICA's chief Priscilla Mueller says they are now filing with the BC Court of Appeal. The river is, you know, literally almost destroyed. And so what we want to do is we want to um, ask the Court of Appeal to um, hold Rio Tinto accountable for, um, you know, um, interfering with our right to fish. The Kenny Dam was constructed in the 1950s and it diverts water from the Nechaco River to power an aluminum smelter in Kitimat. Chief Mueller says it's been nearly five years since their community has fished the Nechaco River due to low flow. The two nations hope the BC Court of Appeal finds Rio Tinto responsible for the Kenny Dam's impact on the river. It's interfering with our right to fish in our waterways and I'm, I'm really hoping that the court will find them responsible and then we can work together with Rio Tinto Alcan, the province and Canada to restore our river to a more natural flow for the future of, um, you know, for generations. Lee Wilson, APTN National News, Kitimat. We need to take a break, but when we come back, how the nation's opioid crisis is hitting families hard. I need to get some sobriety. I can't wait till the day I become sober and the day I don't deal with addictions anymore.
opioid crisis is getting worse with record overdose deaths across the country. In the Yukon, it's only February, but already the territory's addiction crisis has claimed at least eight lives. Now Yukoners are calling on the territorial government to do more to save more people. Here's Sarah Connors with that story. Like you walk into somewhere and she'd be the one to make everybody laugh. <laughs> 34-year-old Miranda Charlie loved hockey and was an accomplished hockey player. The Vuntuk Gwich'in First Nation citizen left her community of Old Crow in northern Yukon as a teenager to play hockey for Team Yukon. She wanted to play hockey, so she, she did, and she did pretty good. She continued to be involved with her community where she helped with youth recreation. She also took pride in joining the Junior Rangers and later joined the Canadian Rangers alongside her father, Douglas. All I think about is my sister and, you know, she was such a good person. Charlie's younger sister, Chantel Tija, remembers her as a role model to her younger siblings. Just always there for people and just a lot of people loved her and for the person she was. But Charlie struggled with addictions. Tija says last fall, their father died from cancer, which her sister struggled to cope with. Things just got worse for all of us, especially my older sister. But yeah, it was just, um, it was just too hard to quit, I guess. On January 19th, Charlie died from a lethal dose of cocaine mixed with fentanyl and benzodiazepine at the Whitehorse Emergency Shelter. Tija says her sister's death from opioids has been devastating. Miranda was a big part of my life after that, losing our dad. And I feel like I got nobody now, but it's... Um, it's very hard. According to Yukon's chief coroner, eight people died in the territory from illicit drug use between January 3rd to January 24th, which is over a third of all of last year's opioid deaths. Tisha says she doesn't want another family to experience the pain of losing a loved one to opioids. That's why she's speaking out. Not only speaking for my sister, but for everybody else that lost someone in the Yukon right now, it's hard. We lost so many people and we need to just put an end to this somehow. It is time to rally around our communities, our friends, our neighbours and our family members who need our support. Last month, Yukon's Health Minister Tracy Ann McPhee declared a substance use health emergency. It does not grant the government any additional powers or privileges. But McPhee says her government is committing to tackling the substance use crisis. It um, expresses a commitment of our government um, as a priority for government action. Well, basically, she announced the emergency and that's about it. it it's, an empty, it's an empty announcement. Billy Hebschelin is a recovering addict who lives in Whitehorse. The Carcross Tagish First Nation citizen has been clean for 13 years with the help of a treatment center he attended in BC. He says the Yukon is lacking in treatment options and adequate aftercare. The biggest problem here, you know, I see is people are getting sent out to treatment. They're coming back and we have no aftercare plan, period, for them. There's none. When I first got clean and when I first come home from getting clean, there was no, there was one Narcotics Anonymous meeting and I started one for Wednesdays and now I think there's three. And he says that lack of aftercare has devastating consequences. You know, I got a cousin now that, you know, she was in treatment and then she come back. There was no aftercare program and, you know, now she's uh, passed away too because of addictions. McPhee agrees more needs to be done and says her department is working on improving services. I think a coordinated aftercare uh, program that would be available uh, either in communities or in a way that people could connect through communities is absolutely critical. But no new aftercare programming has been announced yet. All this stuff that they're coming up with now should have been done a long time ago. Chantel Tija says solutions are needed now more than ever, so more families won't be impacted. I just hope like, they get the drug 
walks off the street and put an end to all this hurt and pain. I don't know how much more I could take. <laughs> Now she's honoring her sister by encouraging anyone struggling to reach out and get help. But we need to realize, like, we need the help to get through this and looking for healthy ways to get through it. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. Uh, many people in BC with addictions have been struggling for a long time. We brought you a story of Faith Alexis back in 2019, that's more than two years ago. She was trying to survive the streets of Vancouver's downtown east side while fighting addictions. Now, APTN's Tina House has an update and a warning this story may be disturbing to some viewers. Faith Rose Alexis was born on March the 8th, 1982 in Bella Coola, BC. Her mother, Mavis Benson, was just 16 years old at the time. Being really young and naive, I, I just didn't know what I, what I was in for, you know. And after the labor, I was just so exhausted. And she was a beautiful little baby. And, you know, I just totally fell in love with her when she was born. Soon after Faith was born, Mavis became a single mom and moved back to their community, the Cheslata First Nation, near Burns Lake, B.C. Faith's grandparents helped raise her while Mavis finished school. It was the stability in Faith's young life that she yearned for, and she thrived as she learned about her culture. Her mom says Faith wanted to become a movie star and a model. She was excited for her future. In 2002, she even attended the American Indian Film Festival in San Francisco, California to pursue her goals. And then she wanted to go to Hawaii to see the world. She was a beautiful girl. She was always energetic and full of life, and she just loved life. She used to do everything that she could. She was just excited for life every single day. Nearly unrecognizable, we met Faith in 2019. She was then 38 years old and living in Vancouver's downtown Eastside since 2008. Severely addicted to drugs, she lives in a single room occupancy room on Vancouver's East Hastings Street. Her mom, Mavis, says it all started when she got into pills and alcohol when she was about 16 when they moved to Vancouver. In her early 20s, she got sober and had four children. She left the father of her children because she claims he was abusive. She tried hard to raise her kids on her own, but Mavis says she suffered from postpartum depression. So Mavis took custody of three of her grandkids while the youngest was adopted. And then Mavis says, Faith's world turned upside down when her beloved grandmother Mary passed away. When her grandma passed away, her, her world was taken from her. Mavis agreed to wear a GoPro camera for this story. And hours into her search, she finds Faith on East Hastings Street, outside of the SRO where she lives. Hi, Faith. Hi. Oh, Mom, is that you? Yes. Oh, hi, Mom. Hi, baby. Hi. Faith says she has just returned from the hospital and claims that she was tested for COVID-19. However, she was discharged even though she has gaping open wounds on both her arms and hands. How come they didn't even look at your arms and wrap your arms? No, I know, I know, I know. But they didn't anyway. They just charged me. They told me they were like, cough gets worse to come back. Do you sound pretty bad? Yeah. Faith is just one of the thousands of people who are living in poverty. And down here, addiction is just a way of life. And back in 2019, she agreed to be filmed to show the reality of what it's like living in places like this. Oh. For Faith, years of addiction and not taking care of herself has resulted in poor health and a weak immune system, making her a perfect target for COVID-19. This is Faith's room. It's infested with bed bugs and cockroaches and piles of garbage and clothes. The shower is totally filled with clothes and debris, making it unusable. Look at that, oh my goodness. Admittedly heavily addicted to drugs and dealing with mental illness, every day it's the same, finding drugs and doing drugs. Two years after this story was filmed, no, 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 we no, ran no. into Faith oh, on East Tasting Street. So, do you want to get sober, Faith? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes, yes. 
Yeah. Do you yeah. need help to do that? Uh, yes, I do. I need help to get into recovery. Um, I need to go in first. I need to go into the hospital. I need to go into the hospital. I need to check in. I need to um, get my arms finished, um, search so they can get, get some healing. You know, I need to get some sobriety. I can't wait till the day I become sober and the day I don't deal with addictions anymore. Yeah. So what yeah, do you, what yeah. do you want other kids to know about the life down here? It's really hard. Like it's really brutally hard. Like you can even see like the way people walk and they're walking and that they've been down here for years and years and years and years and years. And you don't ever want to end up like that. You don't ever want to end up on a road where you're broke. You don't want to ever become a drug addict. What do you want to say about your children? Um, I love them very much and I miss them so dearly and I can't wait to be home with them and I can't wait to be sober. Shortly after this interview, Faith was admitted to the hospital and is now awaiting treatment. Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. We need to take another break. Stay with us. of the day from the shores of frozen rainy lake on the Kuching first nation this is the incredible view from the home of our viewer debbie adams thanks so much for sh uh, for sharing this great photo keep those pictures coming you can send them to share at aptn.ca for a chance to be our next photo of the day let's take a look now at tomorrow's weather forecast to the east coast we've got three and snow expected for Fredericton, sunshine and two for charlottetown Nain, minus 10, and snow expected. La Grande River, you're getting snow too, minus 23. Shabugamu, minus 1, and snow. Valdor, mix of sun and cloud, minus 3. Minus 2 and snow for North Bay and Sault Ste. Marie. Cloud continues to the north. Uh, Caps kissing, snow, minus 12. Uh, Wawa, minus 9. Pocketawagan, snow, minus 24. Sunshine, though, for Churchill, minus 27. 2 and snow for Winnipeg. Uh, 3 and snow for Dauphin and Brandon. Four in cloud for swift current, mix of sun and cloud, and minus 11 for Saskatoon. One in snow for Buffalo Narrows, minus 27, and snow for Snowy Rapids. Four in sunshine for Grand Prairie, one in snow for Fort McMurray. 
Edmonton's uh, cloud, five degrees sunshine though, and five for Red Deer. Kamloops, seven with some showers expected. Quesnel, sunshine and six. Sunny in Prince George and four degrees. Dees Lake, you're sunny and one. Minus two in sunshine for White Horse Old Crow. Minus 24 and snow. Minus 19 and snow for uh, Norman Wells. Fort Simpson and Wrigley, both minus 18. Inuvik, minus 25 and snow. Politak, minus 26 and snow. Let's uh, sunshine for Nunavut though. Minus 37 in Cambridge Bay. Minus 33 in New Yacht. Minus 17 in snow for Pangerton. Glulik, minus 32 and cloudy. With restrictions being loosened across the country, many of us are looking ahead to traveling once again. Today on In Focus, I talk to Indigenous tour operators across the country to give us some ideas for our next vacations and also how Indigenous tourism is growing in leaps and bounds. And yeah, there's several hundred across this, this country of indigenous owned businesses, right? Uh, whether they're Métis, First Nation or Inuit. The, the reality is what we want our indigenous communities and your viewership to know as well as the rest of the world is that we have some amazing ways that, that indigenous culture shared regardless, regardless of which community it's from. It's done authentically. It's done in, you know, obviously to support local jobs in the community. And more than ever, we need support. I mean, the pandemic is, I think you mentioned at the outset, has been really difficult for our businesses. Uh, many of our businesses were the hardest, the hardest hit within tourism because a lot of our previous customers uh, prior to the pandemic hitting in 2019 were international. So now more than ever, we want Indigenous people, non-Indigenous Canadians to uh, try and think about another way of uh, you know, uh, learning about this country, and I, and I, you know. And so within the cultural center really comprises of, of, of three spots. We've got the artisan gift shop and also the heritage path where the tours are giving and the cultural center, which exposes um, uh, significant items and artifacts and stories uh, that are contained within the center itself. It took three years to get to the open point um, and we were really starting to take off pre-COVID and of course COVID hit and uh, that, that knocked a little bit of wind out of our sails but proved to be uh, a great opportunity for New Brunswickers to connect with First Nations and to learn more about the true history of Canada and to learn about uh, the culture. Well, that is all the news I have for you tonight, but we cannot leave without mentioning that today is National Pizza Day. So to honor the ZA, you should visit our website, aptnnews.ca slash in focus. You can check out our January 26th episode where we featured the best res pizzas from across the country. Maybe for dinner or a late night snack, you can order a pizza from your favorite place to celebrate the day. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Thanks for joining us. We will see you back here tomorrow. Have a great night.